Okay, thanks everyone. Now we were gonna we're gonna we were going to move on to the dance party very, very soon. However, we've got one last minute speaker to come up. His name's Gates. He's done a lot of yeah, he's got a lot of wisdom, uh, a lot of knowledge, and he's gonna he's gonna drop a, an epic download on you. Uh, that's that's me, he's much more articulate than that. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me come up here. My name's Gates. Uh, last week I uh, I wrote an essay because I just needed to get some things out. I just had to get some things off my chest and uh, it was too late to call my mother. She was already in bed, so I wrote it all down. Anyways, I ended up emailing this thing to a couple people, turned it into an essay. I delivered it as a speech at the Occupy GA on Saturday and I've been invited to uh, deliver it as a speech here. So, uh, here goes. Today it is... Hold on, hold on. Can you hear me now? Do you need more light, Dave? No, it's alright. It's alright. It's okay. In other words, can somebody need even more light? No, it's alright. It's okay. Don't worry, don't worry about me. Today it is inescapable that one realizes we live in a global environment. Every facet of social consequence operates on a global scale. Global politics, global economics, global trade, global communication, global travel, you name it, everything is global, okay? The happenings of one nation directly linked to the happenings of the next and others around the world. If there's a flood in Thailand, countries all over the world find themselves short of fire drives or computers. After the nuclear crisis in Japan, we find ourselves short of other commodities like iPad parts, car parts, and the list goes on. Right? It becomes apparent that finances are global, globally interlinked when we look at the scale of currency and debt crises across Europe and the rest of the world that have followed the American meltdown. On CBC Radio the other day, I heard a report about gold mines in South Africa. In parts of South Africa, there are very large gold mines owned by multinational corporations. The South African people work in these mines under terrible conditions and can barely survive. This is, this is the only option for survival for these people. Those who work in the mines are lucky. The rest die in poverty. There are 750,000 cases of tuberculosis reported each year in this region. In South Africa, tuberculosis is a deadly disease. The people contract it from inhaling tiny particles of silicate in the gold mines which they are not protected from. Forget HIV, forget AIDS, forget hunger, forget the other thousand and one reasons that the African people die year after year, decade after decade, by the thousands and millions. This one number alone is staggering. This is all happening at a time when gold is at highest demand. It's selling for more than it ever has before. A time where Western currencies are being sold off in return for gold and other real assets. People are buying gold to protect their wealth, which is threatened by the currencies of many nations losing value in something more than historical norms. I argue that tremendous wealth of people in the West is directly and inextricably linked to tremendous poverty of people in other places. I contend that expendable wealth invested in gold is directly linked to this giant health and humanitarian crisis in South Africa. Just like our demonstration at Olympic Plaza here in Calgary, is one of thousands worldwide. This issue is but a single threat in a complex, interlinked, and interdependent tapestry of thousands of humanitarian and environmental issues facing our civilization today. In thousands of cities worldwide, demonstrations are being made, civil unrest is growing because people recognize the magnitude of these injustices and inequalities among human beings, among members of our human family. People are recognizing that super wealth and super poverty, like everything else, now operate on a global scale. And that these two things are dependent on and perpetuate each other. Today in the world, there are 1 billion people who don't have enough to eat. As of 2008, there were 10 million people on this earth classified as US dollar millionaires. Even in the United States, poverty, joblessness, and homelessness are reaching critical levels. And in a world of finite resources, I argue that it is plainly unjust that some people can have so much while so many others suffer. <laughs> I believe that it is 
unjust, unfair, and unethical for someone to have any more than he needs while another goes hungry, goes cold, or goes sick. I feel like if I don't work for these people, and if I don't buy from these people, I am left without job prospects. I am left without a house. I am left without a car or gas. I find it cruel that my participation in these injustices is assumed and required so that I can find success in the world today. When I was a kid, my mother always told me that I can never blame circumstances for the way I feel, and that I can never be filled with depression or hatred or darkness and say, the world made me this way. She taught me to take ownership of my feelings and of my own life. Well, for a long time now, I've felt a deep and crippling darkness in my heart, and in recent weeks it has gotten deeper and deeper. I started to feel I was drowning. It kept growing in intensity. And I hung on to my mother's wisdom as I searched, and I grasped for answers within myself, trying to find reasons that I could change, or something in my life that I was doing wrong that was making me feel this way, because I wanted to take ownership of that darkness. I was so lost knowing that with my big heart, and with my great mind, and with all my wonderful intentions, and all my tireless will to help others, and my efforts to improve the world in what small way I can, I was still plagued by this darkness. I realized today that the darkness in my heart is the very darkness of the world. It is the recognition of the suffering of others all over the world, and on a massive scale. With all of our advantages and achievements and knowledge, science and technology, it is absolutely uncanny that human beings still suffer the way they do. When I realized, oh, <laughs> I demand immediate, mandatory, global, systematic redistribution of resources that I know is possible to such a degree that every man, every woman, and every child, brothers and sisters of mine on this planet, are ensured real and enduring access to the basic necessities of a good life. Proper food, proper shelter, proper health care, proper education, and proper access to culture and fine arts. I may not have camped at Olympic Plaza, but I believe that I believe in those press protesters and all the others around the world. I stand up for them, and I stand with them, and I will not be satisfied until these conditions are required by international law, just as they have been required by the universal laws of humanity and ethics and of decency for all time. I submit that it is criminal to have more than you need while others suffer for want and lack. Well, it's true. It's true. <laughs>